What's up today guys? Welcome back to the RT Clinic. Today I'm going to show you quick intubation of a neonate. We're going to secure it like this, put on our T-piece, start ventilating just like that. Unfortunately, that's not what the video is about today. It's a little bit more boring, but way more usable. We're going to talk about, he's on CPAP right now, he's all good how a pulse oximeter works, how you can teach it to your patients, your coworkers, and anyone else. Remember, always right upper extremity. Cut to the intro. Sorry for the letdown if you wanted to see a neonatal intubation, but today we're going to talk about something that's probably used on a daily basis in the hospital, and that's a pulse oximeter. I'm going to go through a quick rundown of how I teach people on how a pulse oximeter works. Um, it's really key to know, and there's a couple key aspects to it. Pulse oximeters are super cheap now, right? You can buy them for $20 on Amazon if you're into that stuff. So. Uh, everybody has one, but you should know how they work. So let's get into that. Got the whiteboard. It's all clean. We're going to dirty it up a little bit. So let's get into it. So a pulse oximeter works off of an infrared light. So let me show you that real quick. I'm really bad at drawing if you've seen this in the past. So I'm going to draw a really large finger here. So there's a finger, uh, really not great drawing, but we're looking for any capillary bed. So there's many capillary beds we use. We mainly use the finger. Uh, the fingers, we use some toes, sometimes we use a little nose clip. We also have a forehead probe for those patients that are really clamped off and don't have good perfusion. But what this light needs to do, it needs to go through a capillary bed and shine across the capillary bed to an electrode over here. So let me show you how that works. So we have that light going in. You've seen the red light before. You really want that positioned across from the other side. So if it's a clip, it's really easy, but if it's a wrap, it might be a little bit more difficult. Let that light go in directly through the capillary bed over to this electrode. So we know that what the pulse oximeter is doing is looking at configuration of hemoglobin. Now a hemoglobin has the opportunity to bind four different items and I'll draw a hemoglobin as a plus. So uh, just because of the four binding spots. So here are the options. So we have this, 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 and this. So four spots bound, that's 100%. This is 75%, this is 50%, 25%, and 0% saturated. So what happens is when this light comes across the capillary bed, it hits the, these hemoglobin molecules. And these, the hemoglobin, depending on how saturated it is, the binding spots are saturated, it will bend the light. Now, I don't know the exact direction or angle the light is bent. I just know that for every configuration, it bends the light different. So the light's being bent in all these different ways. All of that bent light is caught in this little electrode right here. And out of that is calculated your saturation. That's pretty cool for the fact that you can buy one for like $20. Pulse oximeters, they come with a caveat. So, okay, first thing I need to stop, we need to talk about. So, to make sure that you do not get made fun of behind your back or, you know, how it is in medicine sometimes. We, when we are monitoring this, this is our SPO2. We're familiar with that. Pulse oximeter, right? Also called our O2 SAT. Okay, O2 sat, like our O2 saturation. All right, so even though we say O2 saturation, you're gonna see this is an actual, but do not, repeat, do not, just, just gonna save you in the end, right? Do not call them O2 stats. Okay, so your O2 stats are 96%. Highly recommended, don't call them that. Say sats, say it real slow. O2 sats, not O2 stats. I'm just gonna save you heartache in the future if you get that change now. So, um, because there's somebody snickering, probably a respiratory therapist snickering when you say 
Well, if my O2 stats are running low right now, uh, they'll say, they'll probably say, they'll hang the phone up and say, we'll be up, and they'll say, I'm gonna go check the stats on room such and such. So um, do not use O2 stats, it just, it's just, it'll help you later on in life. So back to the, uh, the uh, question at hand. So how does the pulse ox work? We have the bent light, comes in at 96%, that's great. Here's the key though. There's more than one thing that can bind to these spots. Now I'll ask that question out there. I'm sure almost everybody knows, especially us, those people that have worked in EMS, uh, you can have a couple different things that bind to hemoglobin. So when we get a blood gas, it actually breaks this down and it's called our co-oximetry. So our co-oximetry breaks down what's bound to hemoglobin. So in this case, you see hemoglobin on these. The first one is oxy oxyhemoglobin. So this is actually looking at the hemoglobin. Oh, that oxygen is bound. That's what we want. We want the oxygen bound to hemoglobin. CO, that's not carbon dioxide, that's carbon monoxide. Binds to 200, the affinity of oxygen. That's all bad news. That will bind to hemoglobin very tightly, very tightly, and it's very difficult to get off. And it's very detrimental to the tissues. The last one is met or a methyl group, methyl group, remember from, um, if you did any chemistry, I did a little bit of chemistry, but uh, CH3 uh, is a methyl group. And that, this problem is, doesn't happen very often, but it's called methylated hemoglobinemia. And that's when a methyl group binds to hemoglobin. The problem is, is that when that binds, oxygen cannot. You only have so many binding spots. So, Methylated hemoglobinemia, I'm just going to talk about that real quick. Everybody has a little bit of that bound, usually less than 1%, but some, some people have a reaction to uh, spray, it's actually hurricane spray, but it's like spray lidocaine. So an endo area after an EGD, a bronch, or something like that, if they had spray lidocaine, they will have a reaction that will bind methyl to hemoglobin. That's not good because that will bind, and then they have to give specifically methylene blue to knock that off. So um, you'll see this maybe in a PACU area. You shouldn't just see this randomly come in the ER. It shouldn't be like that. Well, except for this one, you can, not randomly, but if you have a patient coming in, or let's say you have a, one of your local firefighters coming in, and they were in a house fire and apostle smoke inhalation, and you walk up, all Johnny on the spot, rip out your pulse socks out of your waistband, because you know everybody has those little waistband things with the Velcro on them, makes it cool. So if you have one of those, you put it on the, the firefighter and you say, hey, it's all good, guys. It's all good. Well, he's 100% saturated. The problem is his O2 sats may not be 100%, but it could be 100% saturated because if you have some carbon monoxide poisoning, they are going to show up 100% on a pulse ox. Because remember, a pulse oximeter doesn't actually look at what's bound, it just tells me is something bound. If you have something that binds with 200 times the affinity of oxygen, heck yes, these are all gonna be 100%, but it's not with oxygen. And that's where you get tissue hypoxia, and that's really bad. So to oxygenate your tissues, you have to bind it to hemoglobin. I'll show you one of those in just a second. So we get a blood gas on those patients because we wanna look at what their carbon monox or carboxyhemoglobin, their methemoglobin, and their oxyhemoglobin is. So usually these are like less than 1%, maybe uh, one to 2%. This can actually be up to like five or 6% if you're a heavy smoker. And then this is less than 1%. And then this one is, you know, in a, in a perfect world, 98%. But this is going to all, always add up to 100%. So your hemoglobin has got to bind with one of three things. We like oxygen, but in this case, if this shows 100, that means your pulse ox would have probably shown 100 because it just looks at the total of anything bound to hemoglobin. So that's how pulse ox works. So let's look at how I know that we're getting a correct value. So let me get rid of this real quick. So there's two things that I always do to make sure we're getting a correct value. I like to leave the finger because it's a terrible drawing. So get rid of the stats there. So um, to make sure I'm getting a proper reading on my pulse ox, two different things. The first one is the pleth. So the pleth is when you're looking at it and if you got a, a nice pulse ox, you're gonna see that waveform. And what that is, that's just the pulse rate. So it's reading the pulse rate. These are pretty even. You see how they're pretty even? 
and this will read out, let's say, 86 beats per minute. So um, there's a nice, we call, I call that a nice pleth. This is a nice, really nice pleth. So this is going to go up and down very smoothly. It's not going to be like this and this and flat and all over. A very nice, smooth pleth. And usually after about 10 seconds of a nice pleth, you'll have a very accurate number. So we don't always, sometimes you got the little small pause locks and you can't really see the pleth on it. Let's, this is the really another great method for monitoring a pulse lock. So to make sure it's accurate numbers. So first of all, we, you know, we cannot suspect carbon dioxide poisoning or methylated hemoglobinemia. Two things we got to kind of rule out. But if you're looking at your, uh, you have your pulse rate and your SpO2, and let's say you don't really have, you got a little screen, so your pleth isn't very good, and you feel a heart rate at 80 and 96%. So, um, what I'd like to do is on your pulse ox, it's going to show the pulse rate. I want to make sure that it actually matches what their pulse rate is. So, what I commonly will do is put the pulse ox on their, on their finger, and then I'll go to the other side, and I'll gently feel the radial pulse. If their radial pulse, what I found, if their radial pulse is within five of this, that's a pretty accurate number. You want to make sure that's accurate pulse. Now, if it's re if they're shaking and you don't have the newer technology that kind of sees through the, the shaking, uh, this could show a really high heart rate. It's going to be, this is going to be off in that case. So it's probably going to be false low, I think in that case, I'm not totally for sure. But if your pulse rate is off, do not believe your pulse oximeter. So pulse oximeters are great. Remember, there's two major aspects in breathing, ventilation, oxygenation. This is all looking at oxygenation. You can oxygenate and you may not be ventilating. That's important, that's why I have to get a blood gas so we can look at both sides in most cases. So, let me go into the next level of this though and talk about this last equation and why pulse ox is kind of important in this, in this aspect. So, oh, let's see, CaO2. I think it's 1.34 and um, we'll put a free one for that's pi. That's not right. Okay, I'll probably edit this out and put what in there is in there. But okay, so 1.34 times hemoglobin times. SAO2 plus PAO2 times 0 0.003. So, carrying capacity of our blood for, for oxygen. This is really important. Don't get focused on the formula and how big it is. Just, I always just like to look at both sides of it. So, we got two sides. We got our PAO2 level times 0 0.003 will give us Y. And let's say our 1.34 times hemoglobin times SAT will give us X. So you add those together and it gets your CaO2. So this is really what I'm looking at when I'm looking at how well oxygenating my tissues. Because we can put oxygen in the lungs all day long. We can actually get it over to the bloodstream sometimes. But we've got to carry it to our tissues for it to work. So if you're looking at this equation, you're saying which one is way more important, X or Y, all day long, you should be saying X. So hemoglobin and SAT are way more important than PaO2, okay? Let me show you what PaO2 is compared to our SAT. So, if we have some arterial blood here, we have a big old fat artery here. So we have an artery and we have our hemoglobin floating along. And when they're bound, you know, and we're gonna say they're bound with oxygen this time. That's just the nice thing to do. So that's our oxygen bound to hemoglobin and let's say our stats do it our sat are doing really well I'm like, i almost said stats that's bad so that's bound oxygen pao2 what it is it is dissolved oxygen kind of free floating you could say ready to bind but that's our pao2 so it's floating around remember pao2 is that y side of the equation it doesn't have a lot to do with tissue oxygenation, I kind of like to think of it as reserve. So it's the amount of reserve we have sitting around. This is the key. Carbon monoxide poisoning. You can put a non-rebreather on that patient. And let's say you put a non-rebreather NRB and we're delivering up near 
Uh, we're going to say a PaO2, P big A. If you've seen that equation before, P big A2, let's say 660. So we have 660 in our alveoli, P big AO2. We draw our blood gas and our P little AO2 is super high too. Let's say it's 570 millimeters of mercury. Well, you say, well, well, Jimmy, that's, that's really good. I mean, we're carbon monoxide poisoning, but we've got a lot of extra oxygen floating around in here. Oh, but when we did our blood gas, our carbox, our oxyhemoglobin is, let's say, 85%. Our met hemoglobin is 1%. And then our, this would be 14% because it's got to add up to, is that add up right? 15? Yeah, that adds up right. So that adds up to 100. So right now our carbon, carbon monoxide level is 14%. The problem is, is that 14% of these spots are bound with CO. What do you think we use in that equation? We have to use this 85. So our saturation is low. Hopefully we can make up for that with some hemoglobin, but remember, we put this 570 in that equation, in that CO2 equation, but we gotta multiply it times 0 0.003. So that's really gonna take that factor out. The reason I tell you this is because the best way to oxygenate the tissues is to have oxygen bound to hemoglobin. PaO2 is very nice, but it does not oxygenate the tissues. This dissolved oxygen just doesn't go across the tissues. The majority of oxygen comes from being bound and being dropped off of the tissue. So it's very important, even though you have a high PaO2 number, to look at your co-oximetry in these cases. Because if you have a carbon monoxide poisoning patient, they're going to have a high PaO2, but you're worried about this because they're not actually in the tissues. So that's it for today. Any questions, please comment, uh, like it, subscribe, smash the bell thing, and please help keep my page going. I'm almost to 200, sorry, 200, 2,000 subscribers. So I appreciate all the comments. I'm going to try to get to any of these different um, suggestions that are being given. So there's a lot of great ones. Some I don't know much about. Like somebody asked about a gastrostomy tube. That's kind of like, I won't say it's too far from the diaphragm, but it's kind of far for a respiratory therapist. Uh, I'm really like, like about this level up. Uh, so, um, but anything else? I mean, I love suggestions and I'll try to get to all of them. So thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you later.